Hello, and welcome to Life Under Tampa Bay. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm your host. Today, we're going to be meeting with Tim McDonald and Mike Mitchell, who are scientists with the Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program at the Florida Department of, Natural, of Environmental Protection Marine Research Institute in St. Petersburg. Now, Tim, who I'll introduce in a minute, actually works on the St. Petersburg campus, but Mike is from Charlotte Harbor, one of our many field labs around the state. And we'll talk about those field labs, the programs that they are implementing, and the work they do to execute those programs in just a few minutes. But before we get into that, I'd like to introduce our two guests and give you a little background about their education and their experience and who they are and why they're into marine science in their careers. First, we'll talk with Tim McDonald. Tim? Hi. Um, I'm a native Floridian. I was born in, uh, in Ormond Beach, Florida. Um, I was fishing by the time I was four years old, so I have a definite interest in the ocean. Um, I uh, went to Jacksonville University where I got my undergraduate degree in biology, and the Navy paid for my education, so the next four years of my life were spent on the seas uh, working for the Navy. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I went to work for the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Ford Marine Research Institute, and I've been working with that program ever since 1988. I'm also working on my master's degree at the University of South Florida. Great, Tim. Have you worked with Fisheries Independent Monitoring the entire time you've been at DEP? No, I uh, started with the Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program in 1989, a year after I joined DEP. Okay. Mike, why don't you give us a little background? Well, I grew up outside of Chicago, but I had grandparents that lived in the area, and when we were young kids, we came down to this area, and that's what attracted me to uh, the marine world. And I went through undergraduate school up in Chicago, uh -huh. uh, but taking basic biology, knowing that I always wanted to get into marine science. Okay. Then I came to USF, and I got my master's degree from uh, USF as well, which is right on the same campus as... So the St. Petersburg campus of South Florida. Right. Great. Who'd you study under? I studied under uh, John Briggs. Uh -huh. He's a world-renowned ichthyologist. And what did you do your master's thesis on? I did it on uh, a comparison of ichthyoplankton, the small larval fish, uh -huh. as soon as they hatch. I compared the abundance of the larval fish over seagrass beds versus what we would find under unvegetated areas or sandy bottom habitats. Great. So I guess that's directly applicable to what you're doing now. Right. It was uh, the next step from larvae. We study the uh, juvenile fish and then the adults. Okay. And I understand you've been with Fisheries Independent Monitoring since the very beginning. Right. There, there was basically two of us who got the program and started. Who was that? Uh, Bob McMichael was okay. your, the other person, and we started getting the boats and getting them in shape and developing gears uh, to start the program. Great. And where is Bob now? Bob's in the, in the St. Pete office. Uh, he's running the whole program. Okay. Uh, we've expanded the program greatly. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, field labs in Apalachicola now, uh -huh. Cedar Key, the wow. main one in Tampa Bay, which where we open it up. I work in the Charlotte Harbor Field Lab, which is about 90 miles south of you Tampa Bay. You head that Bay. lab up? Right, I run Great, that Mike. lab. Uh, we've got a, another lab in Florida Bay, and we also have a facility in Melbourne that works the Indian River Lagoon. Okay. Tim, why don't you tell us a, bit, a little bit about fisheries independent monitoring? What is it? And just give me a little bit of the history and the present status, if you would. Okay, there's two ways to uh, gather fisheries data. The traditional method is to use fisheries dependent data, where you actually get the data from the, the uh, recreational or commercial fishermen that are, that are, collect, that are harvesting fish. Um, there's all sorts of biases with that type of data. Uh, the gears improve throughout the years. Fishermen switch from nylon nets to monofilament nets, which are harder to see, so they capture more fish. They also bring in new electronics, such as a GPS, so they can pinpoint and go back to a spot that's got lots of fish. So it's hard to interpret that type of data. What we did is we started up the fisheries independent monitoring program to try to uh, eliminate those biases. And what the fisheries independent monitoring program does is it goes out and scientists actually collect the data. And uh, they do the same standard approaches, same standard methods every time so that the data is comparable from one year to the next. Okay, so what do you mean when you say fisheries independent? Define that term. Uh, a, the <clears throat> fishery is a commercial or recreational fishery. Okay. So with fisheries dependent, you go to who's collecting the fish for harvest to sell, and you get the data from them. With us, we're going out and we collect the fish ourselves, and then we do what we need to do with the fish and release them. So you take the fishery side out of, of it out of the picture. The, uh, the money side of it is, is okay. not there. Right, all right. 
Mike, uh, when and why was this program initiated? And you started speaking a little bit about field labs around the state. Why don't you expand a little bit on that as well and talk to us about these field labs? Okay, we, we did start the program in 1987. Okay. And the reason for that was you know, to eliminate some of the biases that Tim talked about you know, so that we would collect the data the same way from one year to the next. And that way, any changes in abundances that we could look at uh, were due to actual changes in, in the abundance of fish and not due to changes in fishing practices like changes in bag or size right. limits or open or closed seasons. As Tim mentioned. Right. So, so it's a consistent way to collect information. And we also use the data to look at nursery areas to find out where, where the fishes are using, uh, what habitats are using, uh, like seagrass beds or mangroves, uh, what time of year they use those uh, habitats. We also look at the adult and subadult fishes as well, and uh, we find out what are critical habitats for them as well. So That's I guess not only are you eliminating biases due to fishing gear, but also eliminating biases due to uh, effort as it's allocated throughout the year and uh, the areas and habitats the fishermen target. That's right. We, we have standardized methods. If we make an improvement on a gear type, you know, some of our gear types actually have biases as well. We know they don't fish 100%. You know, there is some escape from our nets. But what we do, if we, we make any improvements, we'll do side-by-side -side tests so that we have a, a calibration so that we know uh, how to relate data that we've previously collected to data that we would collect in the future. Okay. Tim, who's paying for this program? Uh, it's initially it was uh, funded by the uh, uh, sports fish restoration money. Every time you go out to uh, buy a fishing rod or a fishing lure or you put uh, gas in your boat, there's a certain tax that the uh, federal government uh, takes from that, and that goes to fund sports fish restoration. That's initially where the money came from, and uh, the, fund, the uh, program is still partly funded through that program. Uh -huh. um, but uh, when the saltwater fishing license money came in, uh, came available in 1987. That's what really funds the program now, is the uh, saltwater fishing licenses. Okay, Mike, uh, you mentioned field labs. Where are these field labs located, and what is the purpose of the field labs? Why do we need anything beyond our St. Petersburg laboratory to sample uh, fish and get an idea of what's happening to them between birth and death? Well, for example, in Charlotte Harbor, uh, some people refer to them as the mullet latitudes more mullet are landed in okay. Charlotte Harbor than anywhere else in the really? state. And so you need to collect data from different areas of the state. You have different climatic conditions. We go from warm temperate areas up in Apalachicola and in the Panhandle of Florida uh, to you know, some, some more mild conditions here in Tampa Bay and in Charlotte Harbor. You know, the cold fronts just don't make it down as far. Right. Uh, Things like snook, which is a very important recreational fish that we study, that doesn't even make it uh, much north of Tampa Bay in any great numbers. So we, we're in these different areas because there's uh, different conditions. And in mm -hmm. order to really uh, get a good idea of what's happening statewide, you need to have uh, these local field labs in order to collect data in, in the specific estuary. So to really appreciate the variety that characterizes Florida, <clears throat> you have to sample a, a variety of different areas. Right. <clears throat> and in those different areas, you get a variety of different fish species, not all of which are the same from site to site. Right. There okay. is, we've done some studies where we've looked at percent <clears throat> overlap, and Charlotte Harbor and Tampa Bay have pretty similar fish faunas because they're pretty close together. Right. They're both on the Gulf of Mexico side. Uh, but it's a little bit different when you look at fishes from, say, Cedar Key or up in the Panhandle. And, and there, uh, those fishes tend to be associated with warm temperate climates, ones that can tolerate cold a little bit better. Okay, why don't you tell us a little bit about these different fish species that you target and why you select them, or do you just take a random sample of everything that's out there? Well, we take data on all the fishes that we collect. Uh, obviously, we, we put more effort towards collecting data on some of the important species like spotted sea trout and red drum and snook. Okay. Uh, you know, since most of our funding comes through uh, 
fishing licenses and, and the taxes from people who are uh, going fishing or, or buying fuel at a marine at a marina, uh, you know, we're, we're concentrating on those so that we can uh, provide information to fisheries managers so they can best manage those fisheries to get as many fish available to fishermen. So there's two fundamental components to this. One is a management component, getting information on important targeted species so that they can be properly managed. But there's a whole separate ecological component fitting in with the whole Department of Environmental Protection's ecosystem management scheme that gets basic ecological information on a variety of different species. Right. We look to uh, determine species relationships <clears throat> among the environment, you know, the environmental parameter parameters, you know, temperature and salinity and oxygen in the water. Uh, and we also look uh, to study species associations. How does prey abundance, you know, all the bait fish, right. how, how do they relate to the predator abundances? So, of course, a lot of those fish you're sampling are, they may not be snook, but they're crucial to snook because that's what snook eat. Right. Okay. And what about invertebrate species? Do you sample any of them, Tom? Yes, we do. Some of the uh, <coughs> commercially and recreational invertebrate species, such as blue crab, uh, pinnated shrimp, and stone crab, we also collect those uh, creatures, and we uh, do the same type of work up with them so that we can track their abundances through time. So you're obtaining a tremendous amount of applicable information on Florida's marine we resources. We are. Just in Tampa Bay alone, in a year, we collect anywhere from 1 to 1.5 million fish the majority of which are released back into the bay system alive. Okay, now you're sampling all of these fish. What size or age groups of fish are you sampling? There's no specific size or age group that we, we sample. It's important to sample the continuum. So initially the program concentrated on juvenile stages, uh, the very young, before they were actually entered into the fishery. And the reason for doing that was that then you have an unbiased sample right. uh, before there's any fishing pressure on them. But we've since realized that we especially with the net ban going into place, that we need the, uh, the data of the sub-adults and adults right as they enter the fishery. And we've expanded the program so that we're also addressing those fish. We've incorporated new gears, such as the 108, the, sorry, 600-foot uh, seine, uh -huh. which we use to sample uh, mangrove shorelines so that we can address snook and redfish populations that we initially couldn't uh, address. Well, we'll talk about gear in a minute, but let me ask you something. I would think that <clears throat> sampling in a fisheries independent uh, manner on the juvenile fish, but then switching over and re relying on a fisheries dependent scheme for the adult fish must have caused you guys some problem and that must have had some uh, influence on you deciding to expand this to the whole program. Is that true? It, it uh, took a while to incorporate it in because using the juvenile gears is very simple gears. Uh, they were already established and uh, it was very simple to, uh, to use the same gears in every field lab. With the, uh, the adult gears are, uh, are more complicated. We had to spend a lot more time developing them and get higher new people, actually, to, uh, to learn these gears and uh, to build them up and establish them in each of the field labs. And each field lab is a little bit different in their habitats and their, uh, where the fish are available. So the uh, gears fish a little bit differently. OK, I think we're going to talk about gears. And I think we have a video showing some of the gears in action with you guys working them. And if we could move into that video, We'll talk a little bit about it, and maybe Mike, both you and Tim, can comment on the video and some of the gears that are being used and uh, just how you apply them in different situations to target perhaps different species or different year classes of the same species so that you get the full range of size classes. And hopefully we can uh, run that video and talk a little bit about it. Uh, in the meantime, how many different types of gears do you use, Mike? We've got a couple of different uh, sains and trawls. Okay, and here's, oh, okay. here's, here's the, video the video up now. So you guys might want to comment on it a little bit. It looks like there's one of your mullet boats. Is that a mullet boat that you use? Right, it's uh, got the engine up front, and that allows us to deploy nets off of the stern of the boat. How does that affect the driving abilities of that boat? I think it would make things very difficult. Makes it a challenge. <laughs> You've yeah, got to have does. a lot of weight in the back of the boat, or it's very hard to steer. Yeah. And somebody told me it's difficult to make a right-hand turn at slow speeds. Why would that be? Oh, the rotation of, of the prop. Just working against you? Right. right. Wow. So this is what you make look very simple and straightforward. It's actually a very difficult uh, uh, exercise requiring quite a bit of uh, expertise and ability. Right. You have to get trained on, on operating any of the DEP uh, vessels. Uh, uh, where are you working boats. right now? 
I believe these samples were taken in the Braden River. Okay, um, and I see you're deploying a net. Yeah, this is a, a boat set seine. That's a 70-foot seine. It's got a 1 8 inch mesh. This is one of our gears that's designed to catch juveniles. We're setting it up against a mangrove bank there. Um, there's three different sets we use with the 70-foot uh, the seine. This is the boat set. We usually use this where there's a steep bank, a drop-off, and uh, it gets too deep to, uh, to actually pull any of the other ways, other methods that we use. Okay. Um, we also use an offshore seine set, which is designed to sample seagrass beds that are removed from the uh, shoreline. And we use a beach set with, uh, where we pull it shoreline, much like this, but it samples a different habitat. Type. Okay, when you say an offshore seine set, you're not talking about offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. No, I'm though. talking offshore in about three feet of water, but it's, it's far. Separated from the land. That's a mullet right there. We've yeah. got, uh, this is, these are fish typical of this backwater habitat. Okay. What would be the salinity in this type of habitat, approximate? I'm thinking it's probably about 12 parts per thousand. So it's uh, very estuarine. Yes. And it yeah. varies with season. Right. With the uh, summer rains that comes, these, these areas drop way down in salinity to almost pure fresh water in certain areas. Well, that's a beautiful area, but there is a net ban in Florida. When these residents of this river see you out there, what do they think? Well, some of them call the Marine Patrol, yeah. and they say somebody's fishing with nets. So I guess that's why you have the big Marine Research sign on the side of the boat. Right. So they that can doesn't tell always you. work, though. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I see you're deploying another net here. What's up? This is a, a trawl. This is designed to sample the deeper waters of the estuary. Okay. You know, greater than six feet and up to about 20 feet in depth will fish this net. Well, this looks like a bigger net with bigger mesh on it. Can you tell me a little bit about that? and exactly how they're deploying it? It's actually called a door trawl. You see uh -huh. the doors that he's adjusting right now. What do those the, doors do? Those doors uh, are forced apart by water pressure as okay. the net's being dragged through the water. It, this net actually drags on the bottom. That chain that just went over is a tickle chain. It'll, it'll scare fish up into the water column, and then the net sweeps that area and captures the fish. This actually is designed to catch smaller species of fish as well. It has about an inch and a half mesh size on okay. the outside. And then we've got a liner just like the seines that we were fishing. It's an eighth inch liner. So we're catching a lot of the smaller fishes with this gear. Smaller members of a, of a large species and smaller species as well, I guess. Right. Correct. How long do you pull it? Go ahead. Inside the rivers we pull it for five minutes just because there tends to be a lot more debris on the bottom uh -huh. and then it fills up quicker. Outside in the actual bay we pull it for 10 minutes. Okay. And we also pull it for a set distance. It, uh, we try to pull it for 0.2 nautical miles inside, outside the bay and 0.1 nautical miles inside the and bay. And you use your GPS to gauge we that distance? We use the GPS to get the distance. Okay. Well, I see they're pulling it in by hand. I would assume that sometimes that's a very difficult little exercise there. When that net is full of detritus, which is dead leaves and that uh -huh. kind of stuff, the, uh, it can get quite heavy. And do you get a lot of shrimp and blue crabs in this sort of net? I would think that it, it is designed for that in the commercial industry. Actually, yes. We get very similar catches to what the commercial fishermen will get in this. Blue crabs and uh, Panea shrimp are two of them. Another one we get quite a few of in this net is uh, the Gulf flounder. Really? Okay, living down on the bottom. Right. In the grass beds or in little blowouts in, amongst Usually the grass beds? Usually off the grass beds. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like they've pretty much retrieved it now. I don't know if we're going to show any catch rate or not, but while they're pulling this net up, I would like to ask you, who uses this data and how is it applied? It's used by quite a few people. The, the major person that, or people that we uh, gather the data for is the uh, Marine Fisheries Commission. They uh -huh. want to know whether abundances are going up or down so they can regulate the stocks. They can put in size limits or bag limits. They're the first people that use the data. Okay. And uh, the uh, other people are uh, Tampa Bay NEP, National Estuaries Program, has right. gotten our data to find out what species are occurring where. Uh, Swift Mud, the uh, Water Management District, has also requested our data. They're looking at uh, how fish populations in each of the rivers uh, will be affected if there's a certain amount of water withdrawn from that river. Um, and also uh, people like the Florida Conservation Association has requested our data. As well as DEP with their ecosystems management yes. application. Yes, it okay. fits in very well with that. Now, you mentioned the Tampa Bay NEP. Mike, is there a Charlotte Harbor NEP? It just began a year uh -huh. ago, and uh, they're just getting started. Charlotte Harbor is considered a much more pristine There's a blue area. crab there, There's Tim. There's a blue crab right there, uh -huh. yes. You've got to be careful with those. Picking them up by the back mm -hmm. is the safest way to do it. Yes, it right is. here what we're doing is we're taking water quality parameters. Every time we pull a gear, we also take the water temperature, the salinity, uh, the dissolved oxygen content, and uh, conductivity, and the pH. 
and that's what that equipment was designed to do. Okay, and how do you apply that information? Well, you can look at that to see if uh, temperature affects the abundance of a fish, say, for okay. example, or salinity. If the, a certain fish prefers a certain salinity. So you're collecting a tremendous amount of data, and now they're putting out what looks to be a really large net. What's the story this on this? Is, this is one of the newest gears that we just developed. Uh, it's one of the adult gears that's called a purse seine. Um, what it is, it's, it's basically a seine. It's got leads on the bottom. It's got floats on the top. You fish it in a, anywhere up to about 10 feet of water. There's purse rings that run along the lead line. The, uh, lead line. And the lead line is the bottom line, the and that's the weight line. that actually that seals it to, it to the, the bottom. bottom. Correct. Okay. And uh, through those rings, we run what's called a pursing line. You can see Steve there is letting out the pursing line. Uh, you set this net in a complete circle. It's a 600-foot seine. Um, and then you get to the other end. You pick up the initial end you let out and the very far end of the net, and you put uh -huh. them together on a weight, and you lower that weight to the bottom. And that holds the net on the bottom while you gather the pursing rings together with a pursing line. So it's just like pulling the two lines on a purse together to close that purse. That's correct. That's okay. what it does, and it closes the fish in the, uh, the net above it. And right here, we're coming up on the other end, and they're okay. about to collect that. How did you pick this site to lay out that purse sink? Every site that we sample is randomly selected by a computer. Uh -huh. uh, we have the, the bay is gridded off into one nautical mile grids, and each grid is numbered, and we've identified which gears can be used in which grids. Based then, upon depth and habitat. Depth and habitat, okay. exactly. And then the computer program randomly selects the site, gives you a latitude and longitude. You go out to that site, you set the gear. Okay, so you go to that point, and that's your drop-off point. That's where you begin. That's correct. Okay, so you're not out there just looking for fish, which would be a tremendously biased technique. That would bias it incredibly. Okay. Uh, a lot of programs use a fixed station design, where you go out and sample the same exact station every time. Uh -huh. and that's, that gives you a great idea of what's at that exact spot. But we're trying to address what's exactly out in the entire estuary. So not only do you randomly select a site, but the next time you go, you'll randomly Completely select a different, different site. different site. Every okay. month, we sample a set number of sites. Now, how does that compare with what goes on in Charlotte Harbor and the other field labs, Mike? That allows us to compare um, data among So you take labs. the same randomized approach at all the field labs as well? Right. Great. So that we can say, all right, what, what's going on with spotted sea trout in Tampa Bay? How does that compare to Charlotte Harbor? And then we look at how they change through time. You can then look at different fishing rates, you know, look, going back and using uh, the fisheries dependent data uh -huh. and put that all together and come up with a, a stock assessment. Okay, that's the, that's yeah. the tom weight right there, which is what holds the lead line on the bottom while you purse it up. This is the net after it's all been pursed. Um, the, catch are, the catch is still in there, and we're about okay. to start recovering the catch. You've got to bring the net on first, and you use a, the roller to help bring it on. It's a, a hydraulic-assisted roller, so it's not too much work, although this net's still considerable amount of work. I guess properly placing it in the bottom of the vessel is a key component of if this, so you it don't, goes out properly. If you don't put time. it in right, and you don't put the rings on the shotgun in the correct order, the net will not go out correctly. And go, the failure to properly deploy the net must cause serious problems because it alters the whole situation in this randomly selected you, point. You take the set, you, if that happens, what you do is you take the net back on board, and there is a set procedure for spiraling to another site, and you spiral to another site and take okay. the sample. So that does happen on occasion, and you've oh, got yes, facilities to deal with that. Yes. Great. So you've thought way ahead on this. Uh, because I know that... It, it appears to me that there is no time to relax while you're doing this work because mm. putting that net back in the bottom of the boat is just as crucial as putting it out in the first place. And you're working up the sample as you run on to your next site. This, this shows the bag uh, uh -huh. still in the water and they're starting to collect the fish. That's okay, so everything's ray. in the boat except for the bag with the animals in it. Correct. Okay. And that's a cow nose ray, which they're measuring. Uh, it's got a stinger on its back, so you have to treat it with a little bit of respect. All right, so they measured it and threw it back over. It has no commercial value, but it's still very important. Correct. And now what? This is a cobia right here. Oh, wow. A cobia is an open ocean fish, isn't it? Well, they do come into the estuaries as well on a seasonal basis. Are we still up in the Braden River? No, I think at this site we were um, offshore the Manatee River. Okay. Offshore, though. So and what we were would actually the salinity the be here? The salinity here is probably 28 to 30 parts so per thousand. So not a totally unexpected catch to get a cobia Not in that entirely, net. no. But the cobia is a very important, or at least an important recreational species. I know people love to fish for There's cobia. There's a very big fishery for cobia inside Tampa Bay. 
So it's not just redfish, snook, and trout. There's a lot of important commercial and recreational species that you guys are gathering data on. That's correct. And as right. you saw there, we tagged the fish before we released it so that we can uh, watch its movements and measure its growth for when it's recaptured. Well, how do you go about tagging it? Uh, there's, it's called a dart tag, and it, it's uh, got a, a anchor on it, and you stick it into the fish's back right behind the, and it hooks in a spine. So that would be the dorsal fin? The dorsal fin, Right yes. at the base of the dorsal fin? That's correct. And uh, It's called a pterygia for the bone there that you okay, hold Okay, and it what does that tag contain? It, it contains a number that you call to uh, report it. It contains a, a specific identifying number so that you can track that fish. Okay. And, and Mike, in the field labs, are you also tagging fish? Yes, we do. There's uh, certain protocols that we have. We'll collect a subsample of certain species in order to uh, look at uh, the age of a fish. We'll, we'll have to sacrifice a few fish that we'll bring back to the lab and we'll take out an otolith. And that bone is in their, uh, uh, their brain capsule. Uh -huh. So we need to sacrifice the fish in order to look at that bone. We'll take a thin section of that and then put that under a microscope and then count the rings just like a tree ring in order to age the fish. So the otolith actually lays down a ring for every year of, of life of that animal? Well, that has to be verified, especially okay. in these warmer climates that we have. Sometimes that ring might be a, an indication of a spawning event, okay. and not only just a, a slow growth period during the winter. Can you tell the difference between a spawning event or a, uh, an annual ring or a storm that might affect these fish or anything like that? Well, what like we that? do is we verify it by, by taking some of these animals and holding them captive and injecting them with a, an antibiotic called tetracycline, uh -huh. which actually will, when it'll be absorbed into the bone tissue, and then when we take a look at that bone and you shine a fluorescent light on that, that tetracycline will glow. Excellent. And so you can uh, look at how many rings were placed after that tetracycline ring was laid down, and then you can determine whether it was a spawning cycle or whether it was a true uh, annual ring. So there's not much guesswork involved in what you guys do. You try to verify everything you do, from the type of net you use, to the place you put it, to the way you interpret the data, to the way you analyze any information that you obtain from those fish. That's right. We've, we've got it down pretty good, but we're always looking for ways to improve. And we, we have a continuous program where we do gear testing, where we look at, at different deployment techniques or different gears themselves. Uh -huh. Like, you know, the person that just uh, has only been used in Tampa Bay for the past, what, about a year or so? We started gear testing two years ago and we incorporated into a standard program this year. Yeah, and we just started using it in Charlotte Harbor this w past year. Where are we going from here with this program? Well, first of all, we're going to start a lab up in Apalachicola Bay. That's an important estuary, uh, especially because the Apalachicola River drains from both Alabama and Georgia and there's all sorts of water uh, extraction concerns right there now so we're going to be starting to to monitor in that crucial estuary and uh, the other thing that we're going to be working on is getting the guilt the uh, the person that out to each of the other field labs starting with cedar key charlotte harbor and indian river so for now it's just a tampa bay just, uh piece of gear that's correct that's but where we that develop the, most of the gears but one of your the key components of this is that everything is standardized amongst field labs so essentially you're trying to obtain information from throughout the state that can be compared on a nice quantitative basis among all these different areas. That's correct. All right, Tim, thanks a lot. Mike, thanks a lot. I appreciate you guys coming in. If the audience wants more information on the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Marine Research Institute, or any of our programs, you may call our Education and Information Office at area code 813-896-8626. Thank you for watching today, and take care out there on the water. Goodbye.